This is NJTV. More dangerous crossings, Broadway River flood control, Bayhead stalled beach replenishment. Could Liberty State Park be open to developers? And women and heart disease, a red letter day, tonight on NJTV News. Major funding for NJTV News provided in part by Barnabas Health. Life is better healthy. Online at BarnabasHealth.org, The Star Ledger, and NJ.com. And the Independent College Fund of New Jersey, in partnership with Partner Engineering and Science, Inc., engineers who understand your business. Hello, I'm Mary Alice Williams. Another day, another two bridges closed for emergency repairs. Reminders that money to repair them is running out, along with commuter disruptions to underscore the point, have become so frequent that it's given rise to some skepticism. Are the bridges really perilous or is it just politics? David Cruz reports. Crews were out this morning making emergency repairs on this stretch of Route 46 in Clifton, shutting down a lane. Over in Hasbrook Heights, this overpass, almost 80 years old, is showing its age. Crews will shut down a lane of Route 17 to effect repairs. The impact on traffic during rush hour? A necessary evil in these days of heightened infrastructure insecurity. Transportation Commissioner Jamie Foxx said this week, restoring our roads and bridges just makes dollars and cents. Businesses often plan five, ten years down the road. They need to know if the infrastructure of the state is going to plan for five or ten years down the road so they can plan accordingly. This is the fifth time in a month that the Department of Transportation has ordered some kind of emergency action on a piece of Jersey infrastructure. Fox has also ordered the inspection of 40 state bridges determined to be in need of emergency work. The general consensus is that New Jersey bridges and roads are falling apart. But it's also true that this is not a new phenomenon, which is begging the question among some people about whether or not all of this emphasis on emergency repairs might have a little to do with ongoing negotiations over the Transportation Trust Fund, which could include a gas tax increase. Let's make no bones about it. The commissioner wants a gas tax raise. It's the only thing that he's ever called for. It's what he's called for at his first time around uh, when he was commissioner of the DOT. And the way to do that, uh, in his eyes, is putting pressure on hardworking New Jerseyans and making it more difficult for them to get to and from work. There is a healthy uh, dose of skepticism uh, by the public and ourselves at Americans for Prosperity as to this being politically motivated. Uh, I guess there's a certain element as far as that's concerned. Uh, my sense, though, you talk to uh, mayors throughout the state, uh, they're crying for additional municipal aid to try to uh, deal with their road infrastructure. Everybody's sensitive because this is a uh, election this year for all of the full assembly and, and people in marginal districts are concerned that this could be their death knell. Which could explain why at a panel discussion this week, some Republican lawmakers said they wouldn't support a gas tax hike. Political? Probably. But scenes like this, and this, could be the kind of political cover an elected official might use to justify a tax hike in an election year. In Hasbrook Heights, I'm David Cruz, NJTV News. In the dead of winter, hope springs for New Jersey students. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Lawrence. While high school seniors endure the white knuckle wait for college acceptance, Ryder University has a match made in academia. Graduate from Brookdale Community College with good grades, and you're in at Ryder automatically. Ryder's partnered with Brookdale to guarantee admissions at a discount with scholarships for transfer students for whom they'll even waive the $50 application fee. Ryder's already cut the same deal with Mercer County College and is working on partnering with other community colleges in the state. To Middletown and a stay of execution for modern day prep. Low enrollment and a million dollar deficit led St. Mary's Parish to announce the co-ed Catholic high school would close for good after graduation in June. And that's triggered a sit-in and a social media movement, hashtag Save the Seraphs, that raised more than $10,000 in just two days. 
So the parish is postponing closing the school for two more months in hopes it can raise a cool million. Quoting to the school community, Canon Law 800.2 that encourages all the faithful to, quote, promote Catholic schools doing everything possible to help in establishing and maintaining them. Finally, Hapatcong, where the school system has a simple solution to next month's controversial park test, students can skip it with a simple note from their parents. The Department of Education says the state's new educational assessments, the Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers exams, are mandatory. But there's no state policy to let parents opt their third to 11th graders out. So districts are freelancing their own protocols. Bloomfield, Delran, Princeton, and others are already issuing options for parents and promising students won't be punished if their parents follow the district procedures, saying the kids can use the time to catch up on their reading. And that's our Garden State Express for Friday, February 6, 2015. Something up in your town? Tip us off. The federal investigation triggered by the George Washington Bridge scandal may be widening far beyond lane closings. In the same week that both The Record and The New York Times reported extravagant travel by Governor Christie, paid for by power brokers with interests in issues before the legislature, revelations today that Christie's friend, former Port Authority Chair David Sampson, was granted direct flights to his weekend home in South Carolina, courtesy of United Airlines at a time when United was negotiating to extend the path to Newark Airport, which is overseen by the Port Authority. The direct flights reportedly ended three days after Sampson stepped down. United confirms they have been issued subpoenas. The U.S. Attorney and Governor's offices have had no comment. And federal investigators are looking into another allegation against the governor, this one from a county prosecutor who claims he was fired for complaining when an indictment against people involved with a Christie campaign donor was scuttled. Bennett Barlin has filed a lawsuit for lost wages and says he's provided evidence to the Justice Department. Christie's office, back in 2012, denied any involvement in the case. In a letter dated last June and obtained by the Associated Press, the U.S. attorney said, quote, it is not apparent on the face of your submission that there have been potential violations of criminal federal law warranting this office's review. Federal funding is flooding in to mitigate flood zones. Sandy's storm surge swamped 319 trains stored in the low-lying Meadowlands Maintenance Complex in Kearney and cost $100 million in damage. NJ Transit and the Stevens Institute of Technology have now been awarded nearly $844,000 to develop an early warning system, giving bosses enough time to get trains to higher ground. And the chronically flooded Rahway River Basin is getting an infusion of federal cash as well, a cool million. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron reports. Senator Bob Menendez joined Union County mayors and others to announce he has secured another half million dollars in the new Obama budget for flood mitigation in the Rahway River watershed. The Rahway River runs from West Orange through Maplewood, Cranford, Rahway, and into the Arthur Kill and has several branches. After big storms, the entire basin is susceptible to floods. Area mayors went to Washington five months ago for help. I told them that this was my number one priority in terms of the Army Corps of Engineer funding that we try to pursue uh, in Washington. Uh, and we are here today to begin to talk about uh, our progress towards that success. For 82 miles from the Watchon Ridges east to the Oranges in Essex County, south to Edison Township in Middlesex, the Rahway River runs through it. A million dollars in federal funds plus a state map of one million already secured will fund the studies needed to design a solution. Part of that will be to enlarge the orange reservoir that sits at the top of the river. How bad is the flooding? It can get very bad in some of these storms. It just comes swooshing down and 
the embankments are not enough to hold it, therefore it comes up and over and goes into the sides, into the houses, into the streets. Climatologists are saying that these storms are going to be more frequent and more vicious and more devastating. And that's because of two words, two words that are not said by any official in the state of New Jersey in, in, in any department, unfortunately, and that's climate change. The flooding has been plaguing this region for years and has only gotten worse with development. We all watched the weather report where we were going to have three feet of snow. And we ran out to the supermarket and had this fear about our snowmageddon and what it could mean. The reality is that the people that live along this basin and the Railway River for the 82-mile stretch live in fear of the weather forecast each and every day. Milburn, the water elevation, the river water elevation at peak period would be um, 2.6 feet lower. And in their downtown, that would be enormous. If you live in the Railway River watershed, flood relief appears to be on the way. Officials say the studies could be complete in 2016. Enlargement of the storage capacity of this reservoir, perhaps a year later. At the Orange Reservoir in West Orange, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. We reported last night that Governor Christie had signed into law a sweeping overhaul in the state power structure affecting North Jersey, creating, in effect, a new agency to oversee the Meadowlands and Liberty State Park. But before the ink was even dry, verbal fists were flying over a single word, development. Brenda Flanagan reports. Do not touch the parks. Ray Edwards often visits Liberty State Park. He's dismayed to learn the Christie administration's actively encouraging plans to develop the park to draw crowds and generate revenues. It should be free and accessible to everyone to just come and enjoy the bay, the view, whether it's winter and a cold day like this mm -hmm. or in the summer with your family. It is the green, free, sacred park behind Lady Liberty and Ellis Island. That's one reason park advocates like Sam Pesson demanded changes to a law just signed by Governor Christie, a law that folded the park into a new Meadowlands Regional Commission with the power to approve development at Liberty State Park. The bill to fix that is in, says its sponsor. The new language, it'll say the DEP is the one that has the governance of the park, and the only thing that the Meadowlands will do is can review plans for them mm -hmm. on their behalf. And that is still going to be a threat, but I'm thankful that the new bill will be taking out the most dangerous language. But park advocates and environmentalists remain deeply concerned about linking Liberty State Park to the Meadowlands, and they condemn the Christie administration's Sustainable Parks Initiative. They definitely want to see the park as a revenue-generating cash cow, and that is wrong. The public needs to know what's going on here. How many Chris Christie consultants does it take to walk a developer around Liberty State Park? So far, it's been three. We're looking at every inch of the park, DEP spokesman Larry Raganese says. What amenities can we add? What services and programs? Because it's the perfect site for events. At the moment, it's just where people go to get on the ferry. The potential to improve recreational possibilities are enormous. Improve the park and bring in more revenues. That's the goal. And that's why the park's in the new commission. DEP wanted this because they wanted to be able to have this uh, commission be able to review plans. And DEP's already got proposals according to their paid consultant, New Jersey Future, which brought in Dan Biederman, the same developer who renovated Military Park in Newark. You get a win-win out of these kinds of efforts, generating revenue, says New Jersey Future's Peter Kassebach, and the parks are much better maintained. People enjoy them more. He says DEP has Biederman's proposals. It's in their hands. We suggested and encouraged them to share with the public as soon as possible. If they would just once in a while come out of a back room tell people what they want to do, why they want to do it, how they're going to fund it, a lot of this wouldn't need to happen. 
advocacy groups say the war of attrition shall now begin and that they will fight any development they feel violates what they call this park's noble purpose. At Liberty State Park, I'm Brenda Flanagan and JTV News. Along the shore in Bayhead, the post Sandy Beach replenishment project is so far dead in the water with homeowners refusing to sign away easements to the state and the state threatening to take homeowners' property away. Now the year-long standoff has devolved into name-calling. Michael Hill reports. You want to enjoy the beach and that's what Bayhead believes in. But don't mistake retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Bob Hines' welcome mat for any old doormat. Hines is among the owners of 123 Bayhead properties here, saying no to signing away their private beaches that the public uses to New Jersey's Department of Environmental Protection. The Army Corps of Engineers requires the easements to rebuild beaches with dunes and berms to make the beaches wider and higher from Point Pleasant Beach down to Seaside Park in Northern Ocean County, mostly for storm protection. Why haven't you signed it? I have a little doubt on what they're actually saying. Uh, it would benefit some. Hines says he's read the fine print and the beaches would become public and the cost of lifeguards and maintenance could fall on taxpayers instead of a not-for-profit collecting user fees right now. And do the landowners get any compensation for giving up their private property to the state? A DEP spokesman told NJTV News, no, Michael, the compensation is the protection of their homes. That echoes DEP Commissioner Bob Martin, who says after the landowners sign away their ownership, they would still owe taxes on the land. If they want to go challenge that with their towns, they can if they want to at the end of the day. But, you know, they're still, they still have the use of that property, like everyone else has the use of that property at the end of the day. So basically I lose the two-thirds of my lot that they're going to build the dune on. Many Bayhead property owners, more than in any other coastal town, reject the project because they say Bayhead is different with its dunes. And rock revetment, a wall of sand-covered boulders that line Bayhead shore and prevented major sandy damage to houses behind it. The rock revetment actually will dissipate the kinetic energy from the waves, whereas the sand will block the first wave or two, and then as sand tends to do, it'll probably wash away. Commissioner Martin says Superstorm Sandy made it obvious the shore needs the protection without any gaps, so the project needs Bayhead's beachfront. As for Bayhead's rock revetment and property owners, not the town, paying $1,700 a linear foot to complete the revetment from the early 60s? At the end of the day, uh, if they're protected and they think they're protected, but they're not going to protect the other towns, that's selfish. But do you think that's helpful to use terms like that, though, when you're trying to negotiate with them? Um, we've been working with them, you know, for a year and a half now. All his letters say, sign it or we're going to come take it. I think it's a shame that, that Governor Christie and some others have, have characterized the homeowners as selfish homeowners. The state has made it clear so far if the homeowners don't sign the easements, then the state will take their land by eminent domain. We'd love people to voluntarily bring those to us. If not, we will take those. In the long run, the state can hire more lawyers and last longer than anybody. So if they really want, they'll take it. Property owners say they know the threat is real, and some have consulted lawyers in anticipation, a fight that could delay beach rebuilding way beyond just a year. In Bayhead, Michael Hill, NJTV News. Support for the Environment Report provided by PSENG, making things more sustainable for New Jersey. Support for the medical report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. The nation's primary health care providers are women. We take care of our children, our parents, our husbands. We all too often skip the routine checkups required to take care of ourselves. The American Heart Association's Wear Red campaign has led to more research into women's heart health and more clinical trials to study our unique symptoms. But there's a long way to go. Here's Lauren Monco. At 55 years old, I had a heart attack, and I'm a survivor. Hospital food and nutrition coordinator Susan Graham never saw it coming. I was completely shocked. 
I still am when I think about it. Heart disease in women is, uh, is an incredibly prevalent uh, issue. It is the number one killer in the United States, far surpassing all cancers combined in women. Nationwide, one in three women dies of heart disease and stroke each year. The American Heart Association indicates an estimated 43 million women are affected by cardiovascular diseases. In New Jersey, heart disease is the leading cause of death among both men and women, with more than 18,000 lives lost each year. Meridian Cardiovascular Network's Dr. Brett C. Love. Women and heart disease was, um, is pretty underrepresented predominantly because it used to be considered an old man's disease. And back in 10, 20 years ago, women really weren't included in any clinical trials. And now we are realizing that it's underappreciated, underrepresented, and often underrecognized. Uh, the symptoms men typically experience when they're having a heart attack include shortness of breath, sweatiness, and extreme chest pain and pressure that often radiates to the jaw or left arm. Dr. Seelove says the problem is the majority of the women show non-classic symptoms. I had a little discomfort between my shoulder blades no chest pain, no shortness of breath. So I thought maybe I just had some indigestion. An avid runner, Susan always stuck to a healthy diet and lifestyle and went for regular checkups. I didn't fit any of the mold for a heart attack. So why don't women show the classic symptoms of a heart attack? Well, the answer really is nobody knows. But there probably is something in the hormonal milieu, shall we say, that the estrogen and hormonal balance in women is just different than men, and they could present very differently. In an effort to end heart disease and stroke in women, the American Heart Association launched a national movement called Go Red for Women. So today, red's the color of choice in businesses and hospitals throughout the state. Dr. Seelove says women need to pay attention to risk factors like obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, and lack of physical activity. My message to women is make sure you get regular checkups and don't hold back if you have little symptoms that you might think, oh, that's nothing, because frankly, it could be, it's something. Today, Susan feels fortunate to call herself a survivor. I'm alive, frankly. I've got family, grandchildren that I'm enjoying right now, and I would miss out on that. In Brick Township, I'm Lauren Wonko, and TV News. The shoulder pads and filofaxes of the early 1990s gave way to a revolutionary period on the planet, and American art reflected it all. At the Montclair Art Museum's first of its kind exhibit, the name itself conveys the meaning. It's Kurt Cobain's Come As You Are. Here's Maddie Orton with NJ Arts. We can talk about politics or Melrose Place or whatever you want. It's been 20 years since Whitewater, Rodney King, Netscape, and Nirvana. Enough time to see the 90s through new eyes. Montclair Art Museum's show, Come As You Are, Art of the 1990s, opens this weekend, and it will be the first of its kind. Museum director, Laura Urbanelli. Others have dipped their toe into the period, looking at the social changes, looking at the art of the time, but this is the first comprehensive look that an art museum has done. We're really, really proud to be the ones doing it. The show will go on to tour museums in Georgia, Michigan, and Texas. But first, finishing touches must be made in Montclair. This exhibit is four years in the making for Montclair's contemporary art curator, Alexandra Schwartz. Well, there are two bookends to the show. In 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the subsequent collapse of communism. And then in 2001, the 9-11 attacks. And in between, things changed a lot. Schwartz broke the show down into three primary focuses, identity politics, globalization, and the digital revolution. <laughs> Internet art gets a fair amount of attention in the exhibit. If that term leaves you scratching your head. Internet art was a phenomenon that really was born and kind of died in the 1990s. Art that was made exclusively for the web using those nascent technologies. <laughs> And then the technologies became outdated. You couldn't really sell internet art pieces. So a lot of those artists moved on to integrate digital technologies into a broader artistic practice. Artist Marina Zerko is one of them. It was a chance for 
marginal artists to distribute with very limited means. Keith and Mendy Obadike's 2001 work, Blackness for Sale, is featured in the exhibition. The Obadikes like to work in public spaces. So as unique web pages gave way to profiles on sites like Facebook, they felt that shift in the world of internet art. It doesn't feel as public when it's, you know, a platform that everybody understands is connected to a uh, a, a private corporation. Patrons will travel back in time through clothing and technology in the artwork. But ultimately, what they might find most striking are the similarities between topics of interest 20 years ago and today. I found that it was really a transformative decade, and a lot of the questions that we're still sorting through now came up then. This look back doesn't end with the art on the walls. The museum will co-host a film series with the Montclair Film Festival, and will pay homage to the tunes of the time with a 90s dance party. In Montclair, I'm Maddie Orton for NJTV News. And I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. Have a wonderful weekend. New Jersey manufacturers, auto insurance, and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. PSE&G, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Verizon, communication solutions designed for the people and businesses of New Jersey and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. At the Independent College Fund of New Jersey, our mission is to empower deserving students to realize their goals. We strengthen New Jersey's independent colleges and universities with support from corporate and philanthropic partners for strategic investments in programs, scholarships, and education. Together, we are building a stronger New Jersey, one student at a time. Message made possible in part by Partner Engineering and Science, Inc., engineers who understand your business.